So one of the one of the biggest myths that they tell us is that things are constantly the same. We've heard that a lot, you know, things never change, there's this permanent human nature, people only act a certain way. And the fact that we're out here at a protest about tuition hikes is actually one, some of the biggest proof that that's not true. Um, my grandparents went to college for free. They went to college on the GI Bill. I think most of our grandparents did. If you fought in the Second World War, you got to go to college for free. My father, he went to college and he worked in a factory during the summer while he was in college. And he was able to pay for not only his tuition, but also his, uh, his room and board for the year based on just working three months in the summer in a book bindery, right? Now, this new phenomenon of people being in debt of hundreds of thousands of dollars sometimes just for trying to get an education, that's a very new thing. It's a new development. And, and it shows things are changing constantly throughout society. Um, you know, it also, one big new phenomenon is home foreclosures. All across the United States, homes are being foreclosed. Uh, you know, there's whole neighborhoods in Detroit. It actually started with, you know, racist predatory lending. They went after African-American people, the, the African-American middle class, but it soon expanded to, to everyone. And now there's homes everywhere that have been foreclosed and shut down. And right now also we're seeing an expanding amount of police uh, terror and brutality. Uh, you know, they've got two million people in prison. On top of that, you know, you've got stop and frisk. You know, if you're most major cities, you know, the police can stop you and pat you down at any point. You know, it's an illegal search, but it, but it goes on. And they got the surveillance drones flying above. And, uh, you know, one, one, one of the struggles I was involved in in Cleveland, just after I got involved in, in, in Workers' World Party, which I'm, I'm a member of, was uh, my, my involvement in, with, a, with the case of Rebecca Whitby. Uh, Rebecca Whitby was a, was a young woman, she was 20 years old, and uh, you know, she had had a little too much to drink one night. And her father, who was a veteran um, and a, a former alcoholic, he, he, he didn't want her to get in her car and, and drive because she was under the influence. So he made what he said was actually the biggest mistake in his entire life, and he called the police. And the police showed up. By the time the police had gotten there, Rebecca had agreed not to, to get into her car. But the police barged in anyway, and they, they went upstairs to where Rebecca was, and they, uh, they slammed her head into the ground, and they then uh, ripped off her shirt and her bra and began choking her with it. And then her mother threw herself over her daughter's body. And uh, at that point, the police you know, they pulled out their batons and started beating on the mother. And they were both dragged uh, to jail, and their neighbor, who lived across the street, an, an older white woman, uh, you know, ran out of the house when she saw the police cars outside, and she heard the cops, you know, shoving them into the car and shouting, you know, you, you, you know, black bitch, and all these racial slurs were being shouted at them. And so they were taken to jail, both Rebecca Whitby and her mother, who was also named Rebecca Whitby. And they were taken to jail, and uh, they were released, actually, without charges. And no charges were filed until they filed a complaint against the police. And they filed a complaint because they said these police barged into our house, they choked and nearly killed my daughter, you know, and, and it happened. So then the police charged the Whitby family. They charged them with, uh, they charged the daughter with assault on a police officer and attempted theft of a police officer's firearm. They claimed that the daughter had, like, tried to steal the cop's gun. And so the family went to court for two years. For two years they went to court uh, to deal with this. And, and they were acquitted, they, on, Rebecca was acquitted on every charge. Um, except for except for resisting arrest, and she she was did a little time for resisting arrest. But for two years, the family was dragged into court for two years, and the father actually lost his job uh, because he was a truck driver. And when he was having to go to court every two weeks for with a hearing for two years before it finally gets to trial, he lost his job. Uh, the, the mother also lost her job because she was up for a promotion. And then when they did a background check, found out that she had pending felony charges. She lost her job as well. So they went through, went through all of that for, for two years. And I remember we, we, would, we would be out in front of the Justice Center in Cleveland, which is the big, big center, you know, where, they, where they're at. And, um, you know, we would, we would have these, you know, a picket line. We'd chant, the Whitby's are not guilty. You've got to set them free. We'd be out there for two years until finally a jury got to hear it and they were acquitted. You know, there's no fingerprints on this gun she allegedly took. It was, it was all nonsense. So we see the growing police thing. And the thing is, like, there's, there's, there's cases like this in every major city. You know, New York City gets a lot of publicity because it's this kind of center. You, know, you hear about Ramarley Graham, you know, uh, was, a, was an African-American youth, was walking home. Uh, the cops wanted to stop and frisk him, and he had a joint of marijuana in his pocket, and he didn't want to be stopped and frisked, so he ran away from them. The cops then burst into his apartment, you know, followed him home, burst into his apartment, and then, and then blew, put a bullet through his heart in, in the middle of the apartment in front of his, his grandmother and, and, and his younger brother. You know, you hear about Sean Bell, who was just driving home on his wedding day, and two plainclothes cops, you know, put 41 bullets into his car and killed him. 
you know, but then also in Baltimore it's happening. In Baltimore, you know, people people in Workers' World Party are organizing a, a march from Baltimore to Washington, D.C. against police terror and for jobs. Because in Baltimore it's the same thing. The police are killing people and they're getting away with it. And that's also part of the economic changes that are going on. And, you know, I, I tell people about, you know, when I'm a communist, you know, being a communist isn't just a political belief. You know, if you go to Cuba, you go to, you know, North Korea, you went to the old Soviet Union, if someone said I'm a communist, it didn't mean I think a certain thing. It meant I, I do a certain thing. It means I live a certain lifestyle, you know. When you're a communist, your life is about the struggle. You're constantly involved in struggling with the working class and the oppressed against the ruling class and against the bankers. And your life is about this confrontation. And, uh, and, and, and you know, the heyday of communism in the United States was in the 1930s. Uh, in, in, in 1932, the Communist Party had its national convention in, uh, in New York City, and it was in Madison Square Gardens. Madison Square Gardens is where they had their national convention. It was packed full of people. And uh, I always love to quote, uh, Langston Hughes actually wrote a poem for the, for the convention. And part of the poem is he said, put one more S in the USA and make it Soviet. Put one more S in the USA. Oh, we can win it yet. When the land belongs to the farmers and the factories to working men, the USA, when we take control, will be the USSA then. Yeah, yeah, and that was, uh, you know, at that point in, in the U.S. there were home foreclosures and the Communist Party built these groupings called unemployment councils. And so when they would go to foreclose the home in someone's neighborhood, the Communists would get together and they would bust the lock the sheriff put on the door and they'd burst the doors open and they'd put the family's furniture right back in the home. And I mean, they didn't just have this in New York City or in Chicago, it was all throughout the country they had the unemployment councils that were fighting on behalf of the working class. They had huge hunger marches that they were called, where, you know, tens of thousands of, of unemployed workers, you know, would, would, would go to Washington, D.C., and they would burst into the Capitol building, and they would be chanting, worker wages now, worker wages now, and they would track down, follow their members of Congress and say, why, 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 why are you giving money to the banks, and why aren't you giving us jobs and health care? It was a whole confrontation, and actually March 6th, uh, 1931, was uh, International Unemployment Day. And why was it international? It was because at that point there was something called the Communist International. You know, all, all, the, all the communists in the world were united into this organization called the Common Turner, the Communist International, that was being directed by the Soviet Union. And at, the, at that point, uh, you know, there was a great depression throughout the entire Western world. You know, in the U.S., you know, people weren't just living in tents to, to protest tuition hikes. People were literally living in tents. Now, I know in, in Nevada that's happening now, outside of uh, Las Vegas, there's actually a tent city where hundreds of workers are actually living in tents. People have had their homes foreclosed. But, uh, but, but at that point, there were these things called Hoovervilles all over the country. And Unemployment Day, uh, while, while, the, while the capitalist world was having a Great Depression, the Soviet Union was actually having a boom. And it's one thing that, that, that it's so well hidden, but it's so obvious if you look at it then. The Soviet Union, you know, in 1917, the workers, the peasants, they, they rose up and they overthrew the Tsar. And in the process of overthrowing the Tsar, they built these organizations called Soviets. What is a Soviet? It's a workers' council, or Lenin called it a, a council of workers and soldiers' deputies. And they built these things called Soviets. And eventually, Lenin you know, and the Bolshevik party pushed for a new government, a new kind of state, a workers' state, a workers' council. Right? And, the, and the, Soviet, the Soviets became the basis for a new kind of government in the Soviet Union. And the banks and the factories and the industries and the commanding heights of the economy were actually held in common. You didn't have a small group of people called capitalists like we have in this country who own the economy, you had a collectively run economy. And because of that, because they had a planned economy, because the things weren't being run according to profits, they achieved these real miracles. For example, the, the largest hydroelectric power plant in the world was in the Soviet Union. In the Soviet Union, they went from being a country with barely any plumbing. Uh, the only parts of the country that had electricity were certain areas in the cities. Soon the whole country was lit up with electricity. You had plumbing you know, in, in, the house, in, in houses. You had, you had these villages that were just kind of agrarian villages where people were barely surviving, turning into huge industrial centers. Uh, the life expectancy of, of the Soviet people eventually doubled. You know, people were living at the time of the revolution around 30 or 40 years old. They were living to be 70 and 80 as a result of what socialism did. In the Soviet Union, not a single person was unemployed. You know, you know, in a capitalist economy, we have all these people who are unemployed, you know, because they need to keep the wages down. It's competition for jobs keeps the wages down. But in a socialist economy, you want to include everyone in the, in, in, in the economy. Every bit of labor is utilized to help build in, in collective wealth. And the Soviet Union, they, they built the heart, largest hydroelectric power plant in the world. And then the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union. And, and the Nazis, and they defeated the Nazis. And soon they actually ended up launching Sputnik, the, the first out, spacecraft, and the first people into space was created by socialism. Huge things were achieved because of, because of socialism. And one of the greatest contributions of the Soviet Union was that they aided the black liberation struggle in the United States. 
In the United States, you know, Jim Crow segregation and racism was the ugly aspect of this society. You know, this society was built on the, on the slave labor of African Americans, but the Soviet Union made clear that they opposed that, and actually there was a group of, of young men called the Scottsboro Nine. There were nine young African American men who'd been on a train, and they'd been accused of raping a white, a white prostitute. And, and they were on this train, and, and the Soviet Union, the Communist Party, came to their defense. And uh, um, the mother of one of the Scottsboro Nine went to the Soviet Union and, and went around speaking. And they had huge marches against, against racism and segregation in Moscow, where workers, you know, workers from, from the Soviet Union, from a country nowhere near the United States, were holding up signs saying, down with the Ku Klux Klan and down with racism. And that was happening in a socialist country. I mean, great, great things were achieved. Now, obviously, the Soviet Union isn't there anymore. Now, Cuba, Cuba is still in existence. The Cuba, Cuba is still a stronghold of socialism, and even the CIA World Factbook talks about how Cubans live on average longer than any other people in, in Latin America, and, and they're holding out. And you know, you go to Cuba, it's the same thing: no unemployment. It's a it's a poor country, but compared to other countries in Latin America, the Cubans are much better off because they have a socialist system because there's no ruling class. So. All over this country, there are, there are confrontations going on with, with the bankers and the capitalists, right? We're here talking about tuition hikes. Who is it who wants to keep tuition high so people have to borrow from the banks? It's not the students who want tuition to be high. It's not the government, you know, they just want us to really learn the value of a dollar. It's the banks. The banks run the policy in the United States. Uh, you know, who is it who's building these prisons? They have prisons for profit. Who's doing that? It's the capitalist government of the United States. The, the bankers and the corporations are making money from locking people away. There's class struggle around, around the corner in, every, in every, every sector there. You can find the class struggle, the confrontation between the working class and those, and those who without. And, and ultimately, now back, back in the 30s when people were organizing, and I talk about this upsurge of communism in the United States, you know, they were very inspired by what was going on in the Soviet Union. But there was a book that they read. And it wasn't really about the wonders of socialism in the Soviet Union, but it was called Towards Soviet America. It was by William Z. Foster, the leader of the U.S. Communist Party. And in it, he had a vision for what communism would look like in the United States. You know, he, talk, he laid out a, a vision of the United Soviet States of America, the USSA. This vision of what, what, what it could be like if we had a country where we didn't have Wall Street and the bankers having power. What could that be like? And he talked about, you know, he talked about abolishing unemployment. He talked about all, all the, the unemployed people that were living in tents bursting and seizing those hotels in Manhattan and other places and housing, housing the unemployed. He talked about how, how in the U.S. and the Soviet Union they had to industrialize. They had to build up the industry. But the U.S. already had this industry. It just wasn't under workers' control. And if they could put it under workers' control, real, real miracles could go on. He talked about you know, a revolution in education, having education that empowered the workers to actually be the rulers of society, not teaching people how to follow orders and obey blindly. He talked about all of that, and we really, you know, we really need to start thinking about what a socialist United States would be like. We all need to have that, because if you look at all the struggles that have ever gone on, whether it's the anti-Vietnam War movement, the civil rights movement, you know, the anti-racist struggles, the, the labor movement, all the best fighters have always been communists. They've always been communists, because communists know what it's about. They know that we can get beyond this system. You know, if you see it as just simply a struggle within making the capitalist system better, pretty soon you're going to give up. You're going to lose steam, because, because it's depressing. You know, you can only go to so many meetings. You can only have so many capitalist elections where, you know, you vote for one candidate thinking that they're better and you get the same thing. You can only do that so many times. But if you have a vision, an understanding that there's, there's, there's the possibility of getting beyond this system, of, of actually having a socialist society, you can actually achieve the wondrous things and you can even do things short of revolution that are miraculous, you know. The civil rights movement was largely led by, by communists. The anti-Vietnam War movement was, was largely led by communists. And if, and if we want to actually, you know, stop this, this attack on working people, whether it's the tuition hikes, whether it's the busting of unions, we need to start thinking about socialism and Marxism-Leninism. And Marxism-Leninism is a science. It's a methodology used in the struggle against capitalism, right? You know, you know, Leninism, it's, it's not like a religion. You get that idea. You see pictures of Marx and Lenin and you think, oh, this is a religious idea. You know, the holy work of Marx says this. But no, these are strategies that have been utilized in the struggle, right? They're things we've learned in the process of doing the same thing we're doing now. The Bolsheviks were involved in every strike. They were involved in every struggle. And they, they learned the methods of doing so. And that eventually led to them, you know, the, the the theory of the vanguard party and eventually overthrowing and seizing power in Russia. The Chinese Revolution, there's a lot to learn from that. The Cuban Revolution, the Korean Revolution. All of these are, are struggles. We can all learn from all of that. And that's why I'm very excited. I'm so happy to have been here. And one thing I, I just want to comment on that I thought was one of the best things about this week is, you know, we had these signs and people have been getting a lot of flack for these signs. But people have been stopping to, to talk to us because yeah. people are looking for something different. You know, when I was, when I was, um, 
when I was in college, I was involved in a lot of activism and a lot of young people. It was kind of the, the beginning of the rise of the Ron Paul libertarian stuff. And a lot of people would say, well, I don't want to be a communist because I want to be rich. And I would say to people, you know, you know, we're young people. We're young. You know, we got our whole life ahead of us. You know, it's important. It's, it's, it's okay to have dreams. It's okay to think about the future. But instead of just dreaming about myself and dreaming about, you know, what's in it for me and, you know, my own future, let's start to dream together as a generation. Let's start to think about the world we can construct collectively if we start to fight against the bosses and the super rich. Let's start to think about that. So, you know, I'm inspired by Occupy Wall Street. I'm inspired by what I've seen today. I'm inspired by the labor movement. I'm really excited. And that's really, that's really what communists have to say. That's the communist take on, on the whole struggle going on. So I just want to engage and let's have a conversation about that. That the only way to get rich is by exploiting somebody, by making somebody else poor. Absolutely. Yeah. Why are communists the best fighters for reform? Because they understand how the system works. You know, if you think that this is a democracy and that you can just you can just change it by by voting or writing a letter to your congressman, you're not going to be able to, to do that. Communists understand that it's a life and death struggle between the workers and the bosses, and that that uh, you know, there's one thing you hear about unions. They talk about union thugs. You ever heard that? They talk about union thugs. Well, if you look back at the 30s, the communists when they were when they were when they were acting like thugs, when they were shutting things down, when they were blocking streets, when unions were actually having a confrontational attitude and saying, no, we're not going to let you lower our wages, we're not going to let you destroy our jobs, that's when they actually won things. You know? Got to put the fear in their hearts. Right, yeah, and if you see it as the bosses are just like us and we're just going to sit down and negotiate with them, you're not going to win. Yep. You're not going to win. You know, there's this, a slogan, uh, when, when, uh, when labor plays hardball, workers win, you know. Uh, in 1934 alone, there were three general strikes in this country, in, in San Francisco, in Minneapolis, and in, uh, in Toledo, Ohio. Yeah. In every one of those cities, you know, communists were leading workers in a confrontation with the bosses, shutting the city down, and at the same time they're doing it talking about how that city would be different under workers' control, under workers' power, you know? So, so it's, very, it's, it's very interesting. Any other questions? I was thinking about... Well, you're right. What Could you fascism? Summarize the oh well, question. he he was talking about the government becoming fascist and, and things like that. That's what fascism is. Hitler came to power in Germany because the Communist Party was was one of the biggest political parties at that time, and they they were you know uh, I read a book called Unemployed Struggles. Uh, it was by a leader of, of the communist movement in Britain, and he went to to Germany in 1928. This is before even the Great Depression, right? This is when there was a, a you know quote unquote roaring twenties. And he went there, and in Germany, they would go to um, the big, uh, in the middle of the night, they would go to Berlin, and they would lead these demonstrations of unemployed workers in Berlin, and they would, uh, they, they, would, they would break open the store windows, and they would start redistributing all the bread in Berlin. And then when the police showed up, the communists, they had this group called the Red Front Fighters League, which was the armed wing of the Communist Party, would be on the roof with sniper rifles. And so the cops would, the cops would, would come in to, to attack these people, and the, commun and the communists would be on the roof sniping the cops down. That's how militant the communist movement was. And Hitler was a response to that. Hitler, Hitler was, was fascism is always a response to the people rising up, because the bourgeoisie likes to pretend that we have free speech and we have democracy, but as soon as we start threatening their power, then we see the hammer come down. Then, you know, Occupy Wall Street, they were out there and their park got raided and they saw, they learned all about democracy, people getting arrested for speaking too loud and all kinds of things. You know, bourgeois democracy is a joke, but they, they like to have it. And in any society, as long as society is stable, right, as long as society is stable, you can, you can say whatever you want, right? I mean, it, I could get up, I can get up right now, we can have these flags, why? Because no one's listening to us, right? If there was a real danger of this campus, you know, being seized by the students and kicking them out, they wouldn't be letting us do this. They'd be in here with, you know, there'd be cops here, there'd be clubs, there'd be mace, there'd be riot gear, because... But yet, when, no, but when when the when the banks collapsed, and they needed to get government bailout money or TARP money for the banks, no the form was there. there was barely any paperwork. The form was like two sided, yeah, right? When it's when it's to serve them, you know, we, we talk about the social programs. You know, they they always do everything they can to keep people from collecting 
collecting anything like that or collecting even unemployment, which you pay for, right? You pay for out of, out of your labor. It goes in. But, but, but when, the, when the banks need service or when, look at how efficiently the army moves, you know, when it's time to bomb and destroy some country somewhere that's standing up to the United States, all of a sudden the whole apparatus of everything works really efficiently and they've got drones and bombs, they can do everything. Yeah. You know, we're living in a class society and, uh, and you know, the governments, the governments serve the rich and in a socialist country the governments will work on our behalf. That's the difference. But we don't want a government. We want to eventually get to the time where there's no coercion. You know, socialism is the first stage. That's where the banks, factories, industries are held in common and we have a workers' government based in like community councils, like workers' councils and Soviets. But the higher stage is communism. And that's when there's been so much of an abundance, a material abundance created that we won't have to we won't even have to have a government to begin with. Or and that's money. that's very or money or anything like that. People will be able to, to, to do what they want and take what they need. That's the higher stage and that's the, the end goal. Socialism is socialism is the beginning. And and it's very easy. I mean, it's so obvious that you need socialism at this point. I mean, when you see that there's, you know, how many empty houses for every homeless person? 20. What's 20 empty more? houses for every homeless person. If we had a planned economy, if we had the human mind in control of the economy and not and not the irrational profit motive, we could we could just put the homeless people in the houses. Duh. MP. Right? Or with all these unemployed people. No work is getting done. In this country, the bridges are falling apart. Uh, water isn't being purified. In a socialist country, we'd take, go to the unemployed people and say, your job is to, uh, is to purify the water. It would be that easy. But it's not in capitalism because the profit motive is destroying the world. The profit motive is essentially destroying the, the world. And now, you know, where there's threats of new wars, you know, we got the North Korean flag out here. We got an endless flag for this right now. Well, the U.S. wants a new war against North Korea. They, they want to have a war against the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. And, and it's, it's really, really very frightening because, you know, Obama flew nuclear weapons, B-52 planes, into South Korea. That's what provoked this whole confrontation. Obama flew, you know, B B-52s there and, and basically threatened to nuke them. Yeah, you know, um, and that, that's what it's getting down to. In Syria, you know, the U.S. is sending these, these rebels in there that are destabilizing and tearing up the country. You know, they just bombed and destroyed Libya, you know, a country that had the highest life expectancy on the African continent before it was bombed and destroyed by NATO. You know, it, it, that's what's happening, and, and we live in a global capitalist system, and it's time that, that we come together and have the common sense to overthrow it. Repeat the answer. Uh, I mean, he asked if the U.S. seizes Syria, is that going to be one of the last things? There's always going to be more wars because this U.S. economy depends on war. And that's why revolution yeah. is actually going to be an end to violence in many ways, even though it sounds violent. Is that the system needs there, there, war? There'll always be more wars. The U.S. will never be able to do this. I mean, look at the people that the U.S. fought in Afghanistan and are now fighting in Afghanistan were once people the U.S. was supporting. In Afghanistan in 79, they had a socialist, or it wasn't a socialist revolution, but a democratic revolution, and brought down uh, a U.S.-backed dictator, and they set up, you know, what was called, it was the People's Democratic Party ran Afghanistan. It was teaching women to read, it was had agricultural programs, and they were actually reforestation, a lot of environmental stuff, because the, the forests in Afghanistan have all been cut down by the imperialists to make lumber in Britain. And they were reforesting the country, they had the Democratic Youth Leagues that were going around and reforesting the country. And so, uh, you know, the U.S. started aligning, and uh, Osama bin Laden and al Zarqawi were these wealthy Saudi folks that the U.S. sent in to Afghanistan to destabilize. And so they, they reformed the Mujahideen, and they were running around uh, pouring acid on women's faces and tearing things up. And Reagan actually welcomed to the White House, gave them medals and honors, and said, these are freedom fighters that are fighting against the communists. It was the Soviet Union that sent its troops into Afghanistan at the request of the People's Democratic Party to protect it from, from the U.S.-backed thugs. And, and, um, and, and now, you know, after the Soviet Union, Gorbachev eventually pulled the, the Soviet aid out of there, and eventually the U.S. was able to overturn the democratic government in Afghanistan, and the Taliban came in. But then the Taliban started standing up for Afghanistan against the U.S. And so then the U.S. is now fighting the Taliban. So the U.S. is never going to be at peace with the people of the world, mainly because people want freedom. People don't want to be exploited by anybody, whether it's in, this, in your home country, or what, especially if it's in a far-off country. People don't want to be exploited. And, people, and so people, there will always be a continuing global class war against the U.S. imperialists and the, bank, and the bankers until imperialism is brought down. And that's why socialist countries have had such difficulty in the past. That's why in Cuba, you know, the, the electricity in Cuba is only six hours a day. Why is that? Well, because there's a huge blockade around the country. It's and most, better now. But. Yeah. Mo, uh, there's a huge blockade around the country by the U.S. You know, until imperialism is eradicated, all the socialism we're going to see is, is really in a way going to be premature. To see real socialism, to see socialism the way, you know, as, as a higher system than capitalism, it's going to require U.S. imperialism to be brought down before we can really see the, the beauty of, of what socialism is meant to be. Not that things haven't been achieved. 
because what was done in the Soviet Union, what's been done in, in Cuba, these are amazing achievements, but they're still, they're still not anything near what, what's going to be achieved when socialism as a higher stage than capitalism becomes the dominant world system. It's so outrageous. I, when I was in college, you know, you could be a Marxist in college, in sociology, you know, you can, you can say, you can read Marx, you can talk about it. But the one thing you cannot do is start talking about, uh, you know, socialist countries and saying anything positive. You know, the second you start saying that things are good in Cuba, oh my God, you know, you know there's hell to pay. The second you start saying that, that everything wasn't hell and misery in the Soviet Union, oh my God. But if you look at the, even the anti-communist propaganda in the 50s, actually didn't say that socialism was, was hell and misery, and it was, it was so efficient, it was going to take over, right? You know, it was the red menace. Like, that was, that was what the anti-communist propaganda was. And that's a, a number of the inconsistencies. For example, um, in the 20s, you know, there was, you know, there was this, this propaganda that the communists were behind homosexuality, yeah. right? And that, that uh, you know, the communists were going to make everyone be gay and destroy the family. But now you hear that the communists are all homophobes and they hate gay people. You know, it's really inconsistent. Anti-communist propaganda is very in inconsistent. But one of the, the things you hear about Stalin and Mao is this talk of, like, man-made famines, right? Yeah. They say, oh, you know, the man-made famines. Well, every day, every day was a famine before the Russian Revolution. People were dying annually of starvation. And in China, people were dying annually all the time. And it was those revolutions that actually enabled starvation to be cured in those countries, you know. And in, in the Ukraine, you know, they, they rapidly transitioned, probably too quickly, from a, um, from a, from a, a private agricultural system to a national, you know, a collective farm yeah. system. And they did it very rapidly, and there was almost semi-civil war. A lot of the rich peasants, you know, were burning their crops rather than have them be socialized. And it, was, it was a chaotic situation. But once that situation was over, once, once that was over, the, the food system that actually came out of the collectivization was much more efficient than anything that had ever existed in the entire history of that country. And the life expectancy of Soviet people was, was like, you know, was, was, was nearly doubled. So, you know, the, the whole thing is just, is just a very false premise. And, and there, there are famines, I mean, in Africa, in, you know, the neoliberal governments of Africa where they, they just let the U.S. banks come in there and extract. There's famines there all the time. And no one says, oh, capitalism's committing a genocide. Yeah. Yeah. India, there, there was all kinds of man-made famines. Ireland, Ireland, there were man-made famines, even in the 1800s. So all over, all over the capitalist world, there are man-made, purposeful famines, right? People, and I'll tell you, there's a man, 30,000 children die every day of some kind of uh, starvation-related disease. But we live in a world where there's, there's enough food to feed the entire human race three times over. It's the profit system that is committing a, a man-made famine every day. And, it, and it's socialism has created great achievements in the process of trying to get rid of the capitalist system. And sure, errors have been made, bad things have been done. I'm not going to deny that. But, but the fact that they, that they would even use that against socialism is really just it's vulgar. And it just, just shows you know, the vulgarity of their whole, whole argument. Yeah. Well, you know, that, that's kind of, that's what I was taught in school, is that what the communists want is they want a garbage man to get the exact same wages, and that's, that's really not, not what, what we advocate. We advocate common ownership of the banks, factories, and industries, and eventually leading to a time when we don't need a state, and we can kind of have, uh, and, and that's, that's kind of a non sequitur. But as far as, as China and, you know, the reason, one of the big factors in the collapse of the Soviet Union was the fact that, you know, Gorbachev and, and others, you know, Khrushchev before that, were actually implementing mixed economy policies. They were allowing, they were having capitalism, essentially. They were allowing capitalist sectors of the market. And that eventually created the basis for, for a counter-revolution. The Soviet Union didn't collapse at the time when it had the command economy during the five-year plans, when it was the efficient socialist system. It collapsed later when they were messing around with capitalism. And it collapsed also when the party, you know, the party stopped really preaching, you know, a Marxist message. It started preaching this kind of, like uh, Gorbachev was talking about universal human values. He, he was talking about the ideals of the French Revolution. And it was when they moved away from, from kind of the, the Marxist ideas and when they started implementing kind of reformist ideas, that's when the collapse happened. That's when the collapse happened. The collapse I agree with how you're characterizing things. There's a lot, a lot in what you said there. But, but yeah, I do agree that the market reforms in China are very dangerous and it's causing a lot of problems. I'll agree with you that. And a big reason why socialism here would be different is the only reason why someone uh, like the Chinese even have to contemplate adopting capitalistic elements in their economy. So they had to have a revolution because they were such a poor country to begin with. 
if we had all the wealth that was expropriated from the rest of the world that lies in places like Manhattan and the rest of the US today, we could start building socialism without having any of these market things at all. Small term skills, what would you start to do? You know, like, like just right now, you know, we're, we're big, talking about working on it. Well, the big thing we need to start doing is we, we need to start forming working class organizations. Like, you know, I, I, one, one initiative is like the People's Power Assembly that's going on in New York to try and bring labor unions and Occupy Wall Street and anti-police brutality, anti-racist activists into the same room and start building up something kind of like what the Soviets were in the USSR. And that's the big thing. We need to start building organizations that can represent the entire working class and fight on their behalf and represent different struggles going on that can eventually lay the basis for the wider confrontation and the struggle for power. And, and that's, that's the big thing that, that we need to talk about, you know, is building up power. You know, there's, the biggest myth you've ever heard is that we've got to wait. Wow.